author, historian, and retired Army Colonel Wade Sokolowski is here to discuss the extensive efforts to take care of wounded during the Civil War and how, in an effort to take care of its native sons, North Carolina's fledgling medical department took on a greater role here in the state as well as near the heavy fighting in Virginia. Welcome, Wade. Well, thank you very much, Kathy, for having me here, and thank you to the Newman Historical Society. It is good to, uh, I'm glad, I'll just stay at the thinking out of the box and looking for new ways to do our presentations and keep history alive until we can get back together and enjoy lunch and, and talk about history here in eastern North Carolina. So thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, my topic today will be on North Carolina Civil War hospitals. Uh, it's really no surprise to anyone that roughly uh, probably 90% of the hospitals in North Carolina are Southern and are roughly about 10% are Union. Um, right now, if you went to a public library um, anywhere in our state, uh, even the North Carolina archives, you can't pick up one book off the shelf that talks about North Carolina Civil War hospitals. And I'm talking, it doesn't matter whether it's Confederate or Union. Uh, there's nothing out there. So I, in, in my research here uh, in North Carolina and Civil War history, uh, I started discovering a lot on our hospitals. And I realized, you know, this is something that needs to get put down as part of our historiography here, here in the state of North Carolina on both the Confederate and the Union hospitals that operated here. Now, I've taken this project on as a two-parter. Um, since the vast majority were Southern, the first part, the first book that will come out will cover the Southern hospitals, and then I will follow through with one that addresses the Union. And hopefully at that time, I can come back to the uh, Historical Society and do a lunch and learn, and we'll talk about the Union hospitals, Kathy, there. All right. Let me, let me just throw one little announcement out here. I love doing uh, public speaking, doing battlefield tours, you know it. But normally I'm interacting with the public. I'm not a podium person. I don't have talking notes. Uh, so I'm usually, I'm out and about and moving amongst the audience. This is a new challenge to me. Really my only audience is Kathy in here and, and Charles behind the window over there in the background and my laptop in front of me. So if it seems like I'm kind of odd at sometimes, it just realize, you know, it's something I'm learning here as well. Okay, when I took on this project uh, with the, on the North Carolina's hospitals, it is truly a research challenge because I mentioned that, that there's really no one published source right now. You've got to go to multiple sources, some of them primary, some of them secondary, some of them reminiscent that were written years after the war. But just to give you an example, um, Bob Cook, who's the author of uh, Wild and Wicked Civil War Wilmington, uh, he started this project on Wilmington Civil War hospitals. And you see there a picture of his folders there on the left. Now, Bob was gracious enough to share with me all his research, but when I'm looking at the entire state from the Outer Banks of North Carolina all the way to Asheville and the mountains, you can see it becomes quite a challenge. We are fortunate to have one short piece, roughly 10 pages, uh, by, from a surgeon that was here in North Carolina and 31 years later, he writes a very, like I said, a very short 10-page piece that discusses North Carolina's medical corps. That's Major Peter E. Hines. Now, a lot of contemporary historians will use his writing, that short story again, as almost the gospel. And you have to be careful. It's a great jump-off point. Uh, but what's important to understand about Peter E. Hines is, as you see there, he only served in North Carolina for September of 63 to the end of war, roughly 18 months. The rest of the time, he's in Virginia. Well, one of the first hospitals established here in North Carolina was right over here on Craven Street, here in New Bern, the Noose General Hospital, in September of 1861. So you can see if you follow Peter E. Hines, you're not going to get about uh, 10 years worth of stuff there because, first of all, he's in Virginia. And otherwise, and if you look at his own sentence, he even admits it. Uh, I wrote this in 91, I mean 1901, 36 years later, and I'm writing it off from the top of my head with literally no period documents in front of me. The only other thing that comes close is Dr. H.H. H. Cunningham, who later becomes uh, the president of Elon uh, College here in North Carolina. He wrote the seminal work, Doctors in Gray which still today remains uh, the primary work to go to, but understand he's talking about the entire uh, Confederate medical department. So he just touches on North Carolina every now and then. Now, 
just to give you an example of the research challenge, there's Heinz up there in the right-hand corner, as I mentioned. Well, the gentleman that's before him, Surgeon Edward Covey, who's down here in North Carolina running the hospitals, here's an example, a, a snippet from uh, something out of the National Archives that's totally different than what Heinz lists as the hospitals in North Carolina. So it's important to understand to understand there is a difference there, and that's why we desperately need to have this book written on our hospitals to get the correct hospital story here in the Civil War in North Carolina. Now, to kind of give you a baseline to go from and understanding, um, what we know hospitals today was not the case back in, in the 1800s, uh, middle 1800s. Um, if Kathy, if you were a, <laughs> if you wanted to wind up in one of the three hospitals in the North Carolina before the Civil War. One, you'd have to be insane, and that would send you to the Dix Hospital up in Dix Hill in Raleigh, North Carolina. Or you have to be a merchant mariner who's coming into the port at Portsmouth Island or Wilmington, and you've come down with the flu or the cold or something. So the marine hospitals were really ran by the federal government, okay, and Dix Hill was sponsored by the state, but that's all you have. Doctors back then did house calls. That's, if you were sick, they came to your house to treat you. Now, when the Civil War broke out, it's important to understand we all thought this war was going to be over in a couple months. Johnny Boy is coming home, okay? Uh, we were not prepared for the, the, the gruesome wounds that, that, that occurred in the first several battles early on in the war. But more importantly, when you start bringing Billy and John and George from the various counties, rural areas in North Carolina, and you start putting them in together with all these camps of eight, 900 people at once, they're not used to things like the measles or the mumps. So those kind of diseases started to creep in. So it's not all just about battlefield wounds. It's what we call in the Army today disease and non-battlefield injuries that could keep a soldier out of the fight. So early on in the war, we realized we needed to do something. Here in North Carolina is a list of hospitals. What's important to note is, is that the Confed when I say the Confederate government, I mean Richmond, uh, the medical department, the Confederate Surgeon General there in Richmond, Samuel Preston Moore. Right at the beginning of the war, when we start establishing all these hospitals in eastern North Carolina, it's really loose as a goose. There's no centralized government control. There's no one standard out there. It's all about states' rights. But even here in North Carolina, when we look at these lists of hospitals, Raleigh, for example, was actually appropriated by the legislation in Raleigh. So the first hospital in Raleigh, the Fairgrounds Hospital, um, is actually funded by the state of North Carolina, as well as another hospital in Petersburg. Uh, Virginia for North Carolina troops. The other hospitals listed there are mainly from the local commanders. Um, for example, General Gatlin over in Goldsboro, Kenton area, he's establishing all these hospitals along the coast because 1862, General Burnside has not showed up yet. So we're having to establish these hospitals to take care of all the soldiers that are defending the coastal from Wilmington all the way up along the northern Outer Banks. Now, as the war progresses, we realize that hey, we've got to do something. Um, the Confederate government, the Confederate legislature in September of 1862 passed what's called the Hospital Act. And what you see that beginning at this point in time is the Confederate government, Richmond, the Confederate Surgeon General will start to take more and more responsibility for the operation of our hospitals, the hiring of our surgeons, the certifying them, the taking care of the soldiers. Now one, a couple of the real important things that come out in this Hospital Act of 62 in September is, this is where we start seeing hospitals with numbers. Um, for example, over in Goldsboro, it was always called the College Hospital until September 1862. Now we call it General Hospital Number 3. The other key point is, the law said, hey, keep the Tar Heels with the Tar Heels, keep the boys from uh, Mississippi with Mississippi, because what's happened in a lot of these hospitals is ladies and, and volunteers from Charlotte and Raleigh, from Wilmington, will go up to Virginia with lots of goodies and socks and, and different goodies things, and they help write letters for the soldiers back home to their moms or wives. So it's, not, it's more of a psychological, mental thing to help for the, for the healing of the soldiers. We keep them together. It's, it's one thing to have your cousin three bunks down from you was also wounded as well. The other big thing that's really important is we realize by this time, you know what, uh, Private Wade Sokolowski does not make a very good nurse. 
Uh, they realize that the males are not very good in the healthcare profession, and I apologize for there are good. My daughters and are in there are out there, but let me tell you, back then we just didn't make good nurses uh, because I was too busy realizing that hey, you know, you're wounded in the mouth. You don't need that whiskey ration or that meat ration. I'm gonna take that for myself. But the Confederate government gave the authorization to start hiring matrons and nurses, cooks, and laundresses that work for the surgeons in charge. And to be honest with you, a matron made roughly between forty and forty-five dollars. A month working in these hospitals, which was good money back then. In March of 1863, you see a little bit more control coming in. Now they're because when Richmond started taking over, you can see the span of control. You've got nine different Confederate, I mean, you've got various Confederate states out there. All those hospitals now start sending their weekly reports to Richmond to one guy, Surgeon General. Well, he says, you know what, I've got to break this up. So what's established is the hospital directors for the general hospitals of each individual state. And that's what Peter Hines was, was and, and as well as the other gentlemen. Now, I will tell you, down in Wilmington with General Whiting, those of you who are familiar with Fort Fisher, General Whiting commanded that, that district down in the Cape Fear. He was not happy with this because now the chain of command went from the surgeon in charge of the hospital to the medical director in Raleigh to the surgeon general in Richmond. The commander down at Fort Fisher in Wilmington, General Whiting, was like saying, hey, these are my soldiers you're taking care of down in Wilmington. What do you mean I don't have any vote or say in this? So it was a really big issue with Whiting, but he lost the fight in the end. And the very last act that's pretty significant happens that same year in May, and we're going to talk about the Wayside Hospitals more in a minute. But the big thing is the Confederate government, specifically the Surgeon General, buys off on the fact that, hey, uh, volunteer jet Waysides need to be operated by the government. Now, to put things in a box here for you, as Dr. Fonville, Chris Fonville, said down in Wilmington, he said, well, you be careful now because somebody's going to come up to you and say, well, you know, my grandmother's house was a hospital during the Civil War. You've got to define what you mean, categorize these hospitals. And I've done this on this list, and I'm going to go over each and over one of these um, this today, but I'm going to show you examples as best as I can from hospitals here in eastern North Carolina to help tell the story. The very first one is the camp hospitals, and these are established all over the state. Because remember, early in the war, you've got all these guys coming in from the various counties and mustering stations where they form up a regiment. And here in Carolina City, if I look at the, take my mouse here, and show right here where I'm pointing right there, Carolina City is right here. Um, right along the railroad, but Fort Macon is down here. So the 26th North Carolina, which, which is really a western part of the state, a lot of these companies from this, in the 26th North Carolina were from the Piedmont region of the state. So here's the first time they're down on the Crystal Coast and they're living at Fort Macon on Bogue Banks. They're what we know today as Atlantic Beach. Um, but over in Carolina City, where the Carolina City Hotel is, if you visit Moorhead City today, you've got the Carter General Hospital on the left, the community college on the right, uh, right there where the community college is where a three-story hotel was right prior to the Civil War, and the 26th North Carolina takes over it and uses it as, as its camp hospital because a lot of these boys from the western part of the state were starting to contract the measles and the mumps. Now, I've also included a surgeon up here. This is Spire Singleton. You're going to see certain surgeons popping up throughout my presentation, and it shows you how they're moving from hospital to hospital. Well, Singleton was the Singleton worked for the uh, U.S. government. He was at Portsmouth Island when the war broke out, and he went over to the southern side. And his first job working for as a surgeon is down here in Carolina City when the uh, government takes it over and they start to use it as a general hospital. A post or garrison type hospital. Think of it as a small clinic. You're only talking a few beds. Here's a uh, surgeon Strubwick from Fort Macon. According to Paul Branch, the historian there, um, unless there's a battle going on, Strubwitz Noodle Hospital Clinic was located outside the fort. Now understand we're talking Fort Macon, Fort Anderson, Fisher, Caswell, as well as communities like we know today of the city of Greenville, North Carolina, or Kinston, where you had troops that gared, not a whole lot of troops, but you had to have some kind of medical care for them, so you actually had like a post hospital in Kinston and Greenville. Here's Fort Fisher's post hospital, and notice where Spires, Mr. Singleton, has showed up now. Now he's in Fort Fisher at the end of the war, 
And in January of 1865, when the U.S. forces go after Fort Fisher and they actually capture it, uh, Singleton and Joseph Shepard are actually in the process of doing a surgery amputation at the time, and the Union officer allows them to um, complete the operation, and then they become prisoners. Fort Fisher's normal hospital was located about a mile and a half mile up the beach, north up towards what we know today as, as Carolina Beach. But during the battle, when the Union Navy's pounding the heck out of the place, you really can't take a soldier a mile north. So what you see there is that wartime sketch of the bomb proof inside Fort Fisher that was used as a temporary hospital. Field hospitals are normally associated near a battlefield. Here in North Carolina, in, in North Carolina, the first week of March, you have four major battles. Aversboro, Bentonville, Wise's Fork over in Kenston, and then the Monroe's Crossroads, the big cavalry battle over at Fort Bragg. A lot of casualties are coming out. Here's the field hospital. Um, we're lucky both at Bentonville, Aversboro, and Kenston. The antebellum homes that were plantation homes at the time of the battle, they're all used as field hospitals either by the Union forces or the Confederate forces. Uh, John and Amy Harper's house here was used by the Union Army during the battle, but afterwards they left about 40 to 50 Confederate soldiers that were too triage-wise, could not be moved, and Miss Amy Harper helped nurse a lot of those soldiers uh, back to life. If not, they buried them in, the, in a mass grave, uh, excuse me, not a mass grave, but a grave over at Bentonville. Here's a general hospital. Now, we typically talk, when we think general hospital in the Civil War, now we're talking lots of beds, okay? Uh, now, up in Richmond, for example, the two big ones up there, we're talking three, four, five thousand bed capacity. None of the hospitals, general hospitals here in North Carolina will ever reach that level of capacity. We're talking maybe 500 on a normal day when you're not stressed out. Uh, but early in the war, here's an example over in Little Washington, North Carolina. And the that was established by General Gatlin, but here's March 10th. He's basically telling we need to evacuate because what's going on in eastern North Carolina in March of 1862? Ambrose Burnside has landed. He took Roanoke Island before in February. Now he's moved across the Sound. He's come up the Noose River. He's taken Newburn, and eventually he's going to turn his sights on Beaufort, Moorhead, and Fort Macon. So all those hospitals that I listed to you earlier on that was set up by the Confederate military here are now pretty much moving west along the railroad. And here's Gatlin's orders, uh, original orders, that's shutting down the General Hospital in Little Washington and having it moved over towards Goldsboro. Now, when we look at General Hospitals early on, you're going to pick up on a pattern here. Usually they take over some type of school or college or seminary where you can get multiple stories it's a brick building. Typically, they're located near the railroad. Here's a very, very early uh, picture of the Wilson Female Academy in Wilson, North Carolina. And you see the railroad track right there in the foreground here, in the front part of the picture. What we have here is General Hospital Number 2 in Wilson, North Carolina. Um, what you'll see early on in the war, these, when we start to establish general hospitals that go into these multi-story structures, this is the academy here in Wilson, but you notice they're along the railroad here. Very important. Over here in Goldsboro, North Carolina, notice the Confederate Army moved into and took over the Goldsboro Female College. Once again, a, a multi-story structure um, that was used by uh, the Confederates from since right after the Battle of Newburn is when this hospital was first established. Now, Nurse Kate Sperry Hunt, I want to pause for a second here. I mentioned how we don't have a lot of hospitals. We only had three in the state of North Carolina at the before the beginning of the war. But understand that doctors uh, in Pennsylvania, College of Charleston, uh, University of Virginia, there was medical schools for the training of doctors. If I remember correctly, it's like a two-year program. There was nothing of the sort for nurses or for women working in the hospital. There was no such thing as nursing school to get your RN license. Okay. Uh, but Nurse Kate Sperry is, is interesting because she kept a very wonderful diary. She's actually a refugee. And a lot of the families from eastern North Carolina that will move west when it's occupied by Union forces, and because the husband or their sons are, work, are fighting in the war up in Virginia, 
the, the mother or the wife and children are left alone here, they typically move west, and a lot of them will find employment in the hospitals. Because remember I told you, a matron, head matron, makes $45 a month. And it goes down from that in a graduated scale. But that's a lot of money for a lady whose husband is, uh, is up at the Battle of Gettysburg, and she's down here in North Carolina. Um, what's in another thing about the ladies who work in the hospital, there's a stigma associated with it. Uh, here in the South, a, a lady, a, a southern lady would not dare work in a hospital where she would potentially lay her hands on somebody other than her brother, her husband, or her father. That's like big social fupa. And what you see in the quote down in her diary, Molly Hunt is her cousin. You see, she's from Winchester, Virginia, Kate Sperry is. Uh, her father sends her down to Goldsboro to live with her aunt because it's safe. Um, but eventually, after the Battle of Bentonville, Sherman and the Union forces will come through Goldsboro. By that time, uh, Kate Sperry and the hospital has moved west. But her quote here says, I don't wish Molly Hunt any harm. Only hope that she'll have to attend to some Yankee wounded for saying she wouldn't to see me, but could not call on anyone in a hospital. And what Kate is talking about is that stigma. Her cousin Molly refused to go to that hospital because the men were in there that she did not know. General Hospital Number 5 was actually that Marine Hospital down in Wilmington. Uh, once Wilmington was taken over by the Confederate Forces, um, obviously, why not take over a former federal hospital? And so they, they occupied uh, Number 5, but unfortunately, you know, it was a very small little 51-bed capacity, and that's why Wilmington would have several other hospitals. Now, it does not stand today um, where you visit the Martin Luther King Community Center in, in Wilmington. That is where, uh, the, where the former hospital was today. General Hospital number six in Fayetteville. Have you noticed in something in regards to female seminaries and female colleges? Uh, they don't seem to touch a lot of the male schools, but they're very quickly to take over to female schools here in the state of North Carolina. And here's a perfect example. Once again, multi-story, three-story tall, lots of rooms and stuff for a hospital. Now, over in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, this is one of the few examples of a Civil War hospital in North Carolina, a Confederate Civil War hospital, um, that is still standing today. Uh, if you were to visit, well, it was called Peace Institute during the Civil War. Now it's called William Peace University in, in Raleigh there. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner photo, in the, uh, photo there in color is the actual picture I took a couple years ago. And that same building is up there in, in from an early wartime sketch of, of the hospital itself. Um, so it's one of the original hospitals. It's still there. It still stands here in North Carolina, which makes it kind of unique. But once again, at the time, Peace was a female school. Uh, when the Confederate government took it over, all those windows that you see there in that building, the building was brand new, essentially, but they, the carpenters and the, con the contractor, basically, are still not putting any kind of windows in it. So uh, they take it over, and they're literally having to put canvas up in the windows to keep the cool draft out until the windows are finally put into the hospital. General Hospital number 12, Edgeworth Female Seminary, Greensboro. Now the reason I show this particular hospital, because I was fortunate enough um, to find an extinct document, extant document, original document from April of 1865 um, that shows the number of patients, the end of week report there in that hospital. But right there we see my red arrow, um, you see the individual states once again, because the South is very states, is, you know, it's very Confederate states rights, but they're very important on keeping the number of soldiers you have from the various states and keeping them together. And here you have a breakout of the various Confederate states and how many of those soldiers are in there. That's a lot of soldiers, but we're talking uh, early April, so this is right after the big battles of Aversboro and Bentonville, so a lot of the Confederate wounded are heading west. Number 14, which was the original, what we know today is Wake Forest University over in Winston-Salem. Uh, the original Wake Forest College was in the little town community of Wake Forest, which is just north of Raleigh along the railroad. It was established once again. They took over the school there, and you can see multi-story, lots of dorm rooms, et cetera, makes for a perfect general hospital, right? Well, there's a lady in the top left-hand corner there. Her name is Florence Nightingale, 
And thank you, Charles. Uh, Florence Nightingale is a British nurse. And in the 1850s, during the Crimean War, Florence Nightingale volunteered over in, in that part of the world to take care of the British soldiers. Um, she pioneered a couple works that she titled them Notes on Hospitals here. Let's see if we get that away from the... Oh, um, here we go. Here we go. Thanks, y'all. Sorry, folks. And like I said, first time. Excuse me. Uh, her Notes on Nursing. So when we look at how do these ladies who were willing to volunteer and, and come work in these hospitals when there's no, no, no school out there like the doctors had, they're really doing distance learning. They're getting their hands on the notes on hospitals by Florence Nightingale. Now, what Florence determined was that when you keep all these wounded and sick soldiers in close quarters with not a lot of ventilation, uh, poor climate, etc., they don't seem to heal very well. Now, understand, she's on to something here. And it's somewhat revolutionary because she's going against a lot of old gray-haired doctors in England. It's like, who is this woman talking here, okay? But she is coming forward with this new concept. Now, they haven't figured out the whole theory on germs. That comes after the Civil War. But things like proper sanitation. If you look at that picture there, uh, the bottom, that's Foster General Hospital in Newburn. So it's not just the Confederates that are going to copy her ideas. It's going to be the Union Army as well. Now, they're going to, they're going to take her, her, her slide, and they're going to put subtle changes on it, so it's not Florence Nightingale's idea, it's Wade's idea, but you see the concept there. Look at every one of those windows has a single bed. Every soldier has his own bed. That hospital is built off the ground. Notice how the ventilation goes up and out the roof, so the hot, fresh, fresh air comes through the windows, hot air rises and goes out the top. All right? She's on to keeping these hospital rooms a lot of ventilation. Notice in the top sketch there, the little blueprint sketch there, you see a pot belly stove, but you see the beds to the left and right. That allows the nurse and the doctors to freely move up and take care of their patients. Now this will be the standard for Civil War hospitals that are built. Now remember the dozen slides I just showed you that had taken all over the female schools in Goldsboro and Greensboro, Wake Forest. They're all multi-stories. And there's like a long hallway, you got one door, you got seven or eight soldiers that are sick or wounded inside one little dorm room that has one tiny window. You can see where, where Florence Nightingale is saying, this is not the proper environment, okay? And I love her quote here. It may seem a strange principle to enunciate as the very first requirement in a hospital that it should do the sick no harm. Now, here in the South, in the Confederate Medical Department, here in North Carolina, there will be three new hospitals that are constructed, and all of these hospitals will be of the same design. Now, this is the Confederate Hospital in Raleigh. It looks a lot like Foster General Hospital here in Newburn, the Union Hospital. One-story buildings, lots of windows built off the ground. Once again, they're taking the influence from Florence Nightingale. Now, the, the no, number 13 hospital in Raleigh, 10 and 11 Charlotte and Salisbury, we're looking at four or 500 bed capacity. It fluctuates depending on what monthly reports you do, but they are wooden structures. Unfortunately, none of these survive today uh, where the North Carolina uh, DMV Motor Vehicles Headquarters is at. That's roughly where in the general area where number 13 was as well as the Fairground Hospital. Out in Charlotte, one of these small wooden structures did survive up until the early 1900s when it was eventually sold and, and, and torn down. Now, let's talk about wayside hospitals. Total different category of hospital. Early on in the war, it's a, this is a southern kind of concept. I'm not sure how the Union ladies take it over in Ohio and New York, but it, the, the concept is born in South Carolina. Now, if you listen to the ladies down in South Carolina, Charleston will say they claimed it first. Florence, South Carolina says no. Then Columbia, the ladies from Columbia at USC say, no, we got it. Um, but bottom line is South Carolina did come up with a concept and it caught on very early. What the purpose of a wayside hospital is, we're talking a small little, little uh, operation, always along the railroad, near the depot, and what it was is if Wade was wounded at Gettysburg and I was sent back down to, Getty, to, uh, to the big hospital in Richmond and finally I'm okay to go on like a 30, 60 day furlough and I'm trying to get back to Georgia, well I've got to take the railroad. So along that way, if I have a, a bandage that's starting to uh, bleed or I'm not feeling good or I come down with a fever, I can stop at that wayside hospital along the way 
and I will be able to uh, see a doctor, get a bandage changed, those kind of things. And like I said, early on in the war, it was a volunteer thing. And North Carolina had them all the way out at Salisbury to Wilmington and all parts in between, all along the railroads. But then in May of 1863, uh, Confederate Act there, the amendment to the September 62 Act, basically the Confederate government basically said, hospital directors, you're responsible for establishing wayside hospitals and the government is going to take care of them. What I mean by that is there's going to be a surgeon that's assigned there from Richmond. There's going to be a budget money that's appropriated from the Confederate legislature to run that hospital, to hire nurses, to hire cooks, to hire laundresses. They'll still be assisted by the ladies in Charlotte or Raleigh, but it's now a government-ran hospital. Now, Tarboro is a perfect example here in eastern North Carolina. It kind of starts out the war as kind of a general hospital. And what you see there is a note at the bottom from a gentleman from Tarboro. He's talking about all the wounded coming in from the Battle of Newburn in March of 62. Of course, they take over to Female Academy, um, just like all those schools here in North Carolina. And eventually, uh, the federal government will take, excuse me, the Confederate government will take over. Um, at first is a general hospital and eventually it's turned into a wayside hospital and it will operate all the way till the end of the war. But as you can see, a wayside hospital is not very big. Believe it or not, there was a railroad. Um, the railroad that ran from Tarboro back to Rocky Mount was a little point-to-point -point railroad. And the, the key about Rocky Mount is that's the primary Wilmington and Weldon Railroad that runs north-south through eastern North Carolina. So there was technically a railroad linking Tarboro to it, and that's why you get a wayside hospital out of there. Now, uh, in September of 1863, there was a, a non-government operated, I call it an NGO or non-profit hospital, wayside hospital that was established in High Point at the Barbie Hotel. And that's what you see there. That's the original structure there. It's no longer exists. It was torn down um, in, in the 1990s. It was torn down right along the railroad track in downtown High Point. Uh, it was owned by the Barbies. Here's Miss Barbie there to the left. Um, what's interesting, I found a note where her husband, Mr. Barbie, got out of service in the Army with Governor Vance if he allowed his hotel to be used as a hospital. So nothing wrong with being rich and not having to go fight off in war, but here's a perfect example right here, the Barbie Hotel. Now, it is a, it is a wayside hospital until March of 1865, and look at the bottom left-hand corner who just showed up from Goldsboro. Sherman came through Goldsboro, the hospitals picked up, moved out west along the railroad. Now Kate Sperry Hunt is there. Once again, her diary is a treasure trove, is a diamond if you're a researcher looking for stuff. And uh, here's now General Hospital number three has now uh, displaced from Goldsboro and reestablished in High Point. Here's a, one little map here that shows the big houses there that you see are your general hospitals and the smaller ones are your waysides. But you can see predominantly all of them are along the railroad. Okay, all along the railroad. There's Tarboro up there in the top right, number seven. You see that very small little railroad that linked back to Rocky Mountain. That's why they were able to have that as a wayside. Now, there are, there's a few specialty hospitals that I've kind of thrown in a box. A quarantine hospital, or what they called in Civil War parlance, the Pest House. A perfect example is this house down here in Fayetteville along the Cape Fear River. It's not in downtown Fayetteville. Uh, it is now, but during 1860s it wasn't. Um, but this is where if smallpox break out, um, you had to quarantine injured, I guess COVID-19. If you want to quarantine people, uh, we send them to the, the Pest House is where they would be quarantined for a certain period of time. Over in High Point, here's another refugee from Wilmington, a young 16-year-old girl by the name of Laurel Wesson. She volunteers in the Barbie Hotel at the Wayside Hospital, but towards the end of the war, um, I don't have a picture of the pest house outside High Point. She volunteers out there taking care of the soldiers who've been quarantined. Unfortunately, she comes down with whatever she had and dies, and she's buried there in the cemetery there in High Point, North Carolina. Now, another type of specialty hospital the African American Hospital. Um, it, this was something that was common in Charleston, South Carolina before the war, but up here in North Carolina, um, down around the Cape Fear, lower Cape Fear region, around Wilmington, uh, the earthworks from Fort Fisher, Fort Anderson, uh, the modifications over at Fort Caswell, they were done by uh, either 
hired slaves that were contracted out basically with plantation owners or hired free blacks. Um, because slaves are considered property, they're now working for the army. Um, if the army had uh, whoever working on the thing and gets hurt or gets injured or dies because they're not taken care of, then the Confederate army is actually liable because it's someone else's property. So with that, they contracted with Surgeon uh, Medway here, who was a Wilmington doctor, who ran one of two African-American hospitals that was set up, uh, one in Wilmington, and there's another one over there in what we called during the Civil War Smithfield, which is modern-day Southport. Here's a smallpox hospital at Camp Hill, just uh, south of Wilmington, but there's a young lady there where that red arrow is pointing to. Her name is Harriet Frost. If you look to the right of Harriet Frost, you will see that Harriet Frost is a colored nurse that's employed at General Hospital No. 5 in Wilmington. Now what's interesting here is I just showed you an African-American hospital. Those doctors in No. 5 must have thought very well of Harriet because they actually put her in the smallpox hospital um, that was ran by the Confederate Army where Confederate soldiers would go to. Um, yes, if you think about you had an African-American smallpox hospital and you had a Confederate Army smallpox hospital, guess who got the resources? Guess who got the better food? Guess who, so, but the simple fact that Harriet Frost is in this hospital, it tells me those doctors, uh, it's an assumption on my part, but they, they thought a lot of her, thought a lot of her. Now, Come 1865, if you look all the way to the bottom of the slide, there is Savannah, North Georgia here. Sherman leaves there the first week of February, and he's coming up through the Carolinas. All right, this is William Tecumseh Sherman. Um, just completed his march to the sea, and now he's heading north uh, to link up with uh, General Grant and Battle Robert E. Lee in Virginia. All those stars and numbers and red that you see in red there are hospitals that now are no longer because of Sherman marching up through the Carolinas. The very first star he takes out, you see Wilmington, there's three in Wilmington that are gone once Wilmington and Fort Fisher fall, over in Fayetteville, Goldsboro, and as he moves over to Raleigh, and he occupies Raleigh on April 13th, all these hospitals, a part of the network, are now gone. All these hospitals you see over in Goldsboro, there's two, that's Kate Sperry Hunt. She's moving out towards Greensboro High Point area. The problem is these big battles that are fought in a very brief two-week period in March of 65, Bentonville, Aversboro, Wise's Fork, and Monroe's Crossroads totally overwhelm the system with Confederate wounded. And now that all these hospitals are out of the network and they're being displaced along the railroad, it's going to cause the Confederate uh, hospital director, Peter Hines at this time, to start establishing temporary hospitals. Here's one in Goldsboro, the Wayne County Courthouse. From the, the very first of the four battles in a very brief two-week period is over in Kenston, Wise's Fort. And you can see, uh, and I love this, this is what I say, I love her diary. Um, she talks about a, a, a Yankee hospital was established there for about 200 patients in the old Wayne County Courthouse. And that's Simon Baruch. Um, that, that is the Baruch if you're into investments and money and stuff like that. That is the famous Baruch family. Um, the reason he is there in that hospital is because he is a uh, Prussian immigrant. He speaks a lot of the European, and a lot of these soldiers that were captured were fresh off the boat at Ellis Island, and they didn't know any kind of, didn't speak one word of English. The recruiter got them, sign your name here, become an American citizen, and they're wounded. They can't talk to the doctor, and that's why Simon Brooke is kind of hanging out with them. Now, over in Raleigh, if you look at this map of Raleigh, there's a red line there in the top left on that legenda there, the legend there. Um, all those hospitals above that red line was before William Tecumseh Sherman showed up in North Carolina. 5 through 11 is all temporary hospitals. Remember all that wounded I'm talking about? It's coming from Kinston and Goldsboro, Wilmington. Initially, they come to Raleigh before they continue out. So you can see they're taking over a lot of the churches here. Here's the Baptist church in Raleigh. There's look, look, that's Spears Singleton. Remember, he was last time I talked about him and Shepard, they were captured on January 15th at Fort Fisher. The Union officer allowed them to finish the amputation. Then they went north on a boat as a prisoner of war. But throughout the Civil War, for humanitarian reasons, doctors were very quickly exchanged. And this guy was captured on January 15th at Fort Fisher. And now the first week of March, he's now in a hospital in Raleigh. That's how quick that exchange happened.
late in the war. There's Shepard from Fort Fisher. He's all the way out in the Presbyterian Hospital in the Old Presbyterian Church in Greensboro, North Carolina. Here's Charlotte, uptown Charlotte as we know it today, Independence Square. That small group of buildings there to the right, if you really look hard enough, when you're in uptown Charlotte, you can see the remnants of these buildings, and they were used as a temporary hospital. Uh, one, of the, one of the nurses that worked there was Jane Wilkes, a very young lady. She worked in the Confederate hospitals as a volunteer nurse. But after the war, she really took on the nursing perfection, pr profession, and she established, she's a very key motivator in establishing two hospitals in Charlotte, one for, for white people and two for African Americans. Uh, here recently they put up a statue there in Charlotte to honor Miss Janie Wicks for her work, what she did for nursing in the hospitals in Charlotte, taking care of the people. The other kind of hospitals we have are a few out of state. You can see um, Petersburg, I mentioned very briefly, uh, Richmond, Charleston, Columbia. Now the North Carolina Soldiers Home was it's more like those of former veterans, military, you've traveled, you went to a USO somewhere in an airport. That's pretty much the forerunner of a USO. You didn't have to be wounded, but you got like a three-day pass and you wanted you didn't have time to go back home to North Carolina, so you went and hung out in the soldiers' home there in Richmond. Now, let's bring this local. I've got a few slides on the local piece here in Newburn that talk about the Confederate hospitals. Now, and I, and I put out the, the, the request here. If anyone has any information, please share with me. I'm going to show you my, my email and my address. Get a hold of me because, you know, the, Newburn, the Confederate hospitals in Newburn, pretty much September, October through March of 62. That's an era down there. It should be September, excuse me. 1861, and then Birdside, the Battle of Newburn of 1862. If there is a dot, a circle, a name on this map, that means I have an 1861 or 1862 document signed by that surgeon that says Noose General Hospital was on Craven Street. This is not written, this is not the reminiscence of somebody written 40, 50 years after the war. It's not taken account from a Union surgeon that occupies and thinks he knows what the Confederates were doing okay, before they showed up. This is straight up Confederate primary source. And you see the Noose General Hospital, Branch Hospital, the Forbes House Hospital, and then over there around the Newburn Academy, there's a group of houses you see on that period map. One of those houses there was used to take care of Confederate prisoners as well. Now here's the document there, Noose General Hospital. If I take the mouse, you see right here, this is Surgeon Moore. This is a voucher right here, Noose Hospital. And this is March of 62. Um, based upon what I've been able to, some of these documents and kind of hunting it down on some of the period newspapers, uh, it was located somewhere on Hancock Street between Broad and Park, Pollock to near the Sudam store. Okay, I know some of the folks in Historical Society have done a lot of help there in trying to help figure out where this Sudam store was at that time period. But you can see we're talking 1861 there. Now, the Branch Hospital was a new hospital. It was established in January of 62. This is William Holt who comes in here. Um, we know it's somewhere on Craven Street adjoining the Progress Building. The Forbes House, here's an advertisement. Or not an advertisement, but it's, it's ran in the Newburn Daily Progress. It talks about the Confederate government. It's basically rented out the Forbes House over here on Pollock Street as like an overflow for any kind of uh, soldiers from the two general hospitals in there. The Newburn Academy, from what I have gathered, the Newburn Academy, yes, it is a Union hospital during the war. But during the Confederate time of, of occupation here in Newburn, um, it was used as the headquarters for James J. Waring, who was the medical director for all the hospitals in eastern North Carolina and the purveyor. Um, typically, those offices were kept from the hospitals. Um, it becomes a Union hospital after the Union occupation. Uh, some prisoners may be around there, but from what I can tell so far, it's not used as a Confederate hospital. And once again, I'm looking for that gold nugget, a document from 1861 or 1862. Now, during the Battle of Newburn, uh, James Warren, a little bit of a story here, Edward Warren was a doctor over in Portsmouth Island. All that's been closed now because of Burnside. He's making his way. He eventually becomes the Surgeon General of North Carolina Hospitals. All right? But he's very well politically connected. And he shows up the night before the Battle of Newburn, and he's there so-called, and he writes this, this, this thing to the governor and to the Surgeon General, basically saying James Warren 
ran away uh, and, and shirked on his duties. He was scared because the Union Navy was bombing Newburn, shelling Newburn and stuff. He left wounded and stuff. It was a chaotic scene. But honestly, the more I dug into this, it's more of a snake in the grass kind of thing. Because later what I find is some of those hospitals, the Noose Hospital and the Craven Street Hospital, those surgeons that ran those two hospitals will write uh, 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 sworn letters that validate that Warring was doing everything that he could. So here at the Battle of Newburn, there's a little bit of dereliction of duty and cowardice, um, but it, it makes for an interesting story, and it will make an interesting appendix in the book when we get to it. And thanks to, heads out, thanks to Keith Schaefer out there for helping me with the story here on that one here. Final remarks, and I'm going to end it here. Um, Mary Norcott Bryan. She is born in basically Pitt County, but she's raised in Newburn, and she is buried here in Newburn, but she is typical of the refugees that I talked about. She winds up all the way out in Raleigh as a refugee, and she's working in the Episcopal Church Hospital. Now, this picture of her is like 1940, so you've got to kind of fast forward a little bit age-wise and what she looks like in 1865. But this story here I share with my wife because uh, it's rather sad. Many poor men were on the benches, some in high delirium, some in agony of death. One young soldier passed away, none knew his name or home. As the coffin lid was being screwed down, a dear old lady pressed her lips to his brow and said, let me kiss him for his mother. Every heart responded and all the eyes were filled with tears. There's the pews in the, the original Episcopal Church there in Raleigh. Once again, it's, there's no dog tags back then. It's a young boy, another part of the story that she adds. We knew he was from North Carolina because he had a North Carolina button. But it just rings sad there towards the end. But it shows how far the ladies have come since 1861. They weren't allowed in the hospitals, but now they are. And they actually, uh, if it wasn't for the ladies helping these doctors out, it would have been something. Folks, I do throw this out there. Any questions you have, you want to touch base with me, follow up, um, please. There's my phone number. There's my email address as well as my mail address. I'm always on the hunt for information. I'm always willing to discuss. And uh, please, let's talk Civil War history here in eastern North Carolina. With that said, I'll open it up for uh, questions or uh, here on Q&A and how we're going to do this. But otherwise, I will say thank you once again to the Newburn Historical Society for having me here. Um, and again, I apologize if I seem kind of strange for talking at a, at a laptop. Uh, but other than that, uh, we'll move on. Thank you very much. Well, we thank you, Wade, and thank you for sharing your knowledge and your enthusiasm for the subject. We hope you all appreciate learning more about the history of medical treatment during the Civil War. Please keep watching our Facebook page and newburnhistorical.org for more of Eastern North Carolina stories. If you'd like to join us or support and donate to our effort to collect and share stories from Newburn's historic past, please consider clicking on the Donate button or contact us at 252-638-8558 or newburnhistorical.org or just drop by the office at the Atmore Oliver House at 511 Broad Street in Newburn. Recorded live at the Charles Tendell Studios in Newburn, North Carolina.